Good morning, everybody. Uh, and welcome to this early morning session. Uh, we um, uh, are going to be dealing with a very interesting topic and a big agenda for this morning, uh, which is on uh, essentially where the global order is going and what the outlook would be. Uh, for uh, everyone here watching uh, changes in the world order in the past uh, uh, year, I think the key question is uh, that we are seeing unprecedented level of change in the international order. We're seeing a serious debate about uh, the sustainability of the international liberal order. We're seeing uh, changes to the way in which uh, global powers uh, approached the um, utility of trade, of uh, multilateral uh, alliances, and the ways in which they undergird the international order. And we're also seeing significant uh, uh, threats in areas of crisis from Northeast Asia to, to the Middle East, and also an escalation, or at least tensions in areas that, uh, of the world that previously we did not associate with uh, uh, crises. So as we're seeing a, a significant change in the uh, pre-existing global order, the key question is what is coming next? What, what to expect of the global order? What is the, likely to be the architecture of a new global order? And we have an excellent panel today uh, uh, to discuss uh, these sets of issues. And um, I would like to uh, start uh, with you and uh, um, see what your uh, thoughts are in terms of how uh, this changing picture looks from uh, Japan and, and uh, from Asia's perspective. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, let me primarily focus on Japan's outlook and Japan's perspective. Um, <clears throat> the biggest uh, risk for Japan, uh, particularly uh, Abe administration, uh, remains to uh, be uh, a Trump presidency and ensuing uh, fallout. Uh, Trump, President Trump has insinuated that tariff and uh, numerical targets on auto and auto uh, parts uh, might soon be uh, coming if uh, he doesn't get his way. Uh, and if that should happen, I think it could uh, destabilize that relationship between Japan and the United States. And it, it could certainly would undercut uh, Prime Minister Abe's standing irreparably. Uh, but also uh, Trump's aversion and hostility uh, to multilateralism uh, is very, very much dangerous. Uh, for the past 30, 40 years, Japan and uh, East Asia has benefited greatly from the liberal international order of which a free trade and uh, multilateralism is an essential part as guiding principles. So uh, if the multilateralism uh, would, uh, uh, further unravel, uh, that would uh, have a, a really serious uh, ramifications uh, for uh, the Asia. Uh, uh, also, uh, Trump administration's policy to link the national security and uh, uh, trade issues actually has really complicated uh, Japan's calculations significantly. Uh, it could uh, result in uh, uh, a negative consequences for Japan's national security. Uh, President Trump uh, has raised the possibility that uh, US forces Korea could be withdrawn, uh, undermining that U US Japan and the US ROK alliance. And uh, this linkage also uh, increasing the risks that North Korea uh, will be used as a, a bargaining chip uh, in uh, trade talks between the U.S. and China. And uh, that's, uh, uh, despite, that is despite that uh, very much clear importance for Japan and the broader region in both uh, sec national security and also uh, uh, trading regime. So um, I think that uh, Japan is now really faced with that, uh, those uh, uh, serious risks. Um, for Japan, the uh, collusion and the confrontation between the U.S. and China 
uh, simultaneously uh, would uh, pose as serious risks. Those are highly undesirable. Uh, the collusion between the U.S. and China uh, would uh, 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 see kind of re-emergence re of uh, a new type of great power relations, quote unquote, uh, uh, which uh, where Japan is sidelined. But uh, uh, the confrontation uh, certainly would deprive uh, Japan from uh, uh, freedom of action. Uh, and, and uh, room to maneuver, uh, flexibility, and uh, I think that uh, would uh, uh, actually uh, perhaps uh, would be that the, uh, the biggest, I think, fundamental risk to Japan. Uh, despite of this, perhaps because of this, uh, Prime Minister Abe visited uh, Beijing in late October, uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, has stabilized that relationship between Japan and China uh, very noticeably. And I think it is very much in the right direction. Uh, actually, it is long overdue, in my view, uh, since uh, uh, 2010 when a Chinese uh, captain uh, of fishing boats rammed through the Japanese two coast guards uh, vessels, uh, which really caused a serious strain uh, of the relationship between Japan and China. Uh, it's so we have not recovered from that, uh, from that ground zero. But uh, nonetheless, this uh, is not an attempt uh, to uh, uh, rebalance or pivot. Uh, uh, it is certainly not uh, uh, bandwagoning with China. I think it's a case of uh, administration fine-tuning. Fine uh, that mistrust between Tokyo and Beijing still is very much deep. And uh, uh, so it may seem, uh, take some more time uh, for both countries to really, uh, uh, I think, uh, develop its more uh, trustworthy and mature relationship because we have still carried over the serious territorial historical issues. But nonetheless, I think this is the right direction. And it's also it is a reassuring uh, policy towards ASEAN countries, which actually hate to uh, be uh, uh, forced to choose uh, either Japan or China or, Japan, uh, or China or the United States. So um, uh, Japan's uh, role uh, uh, as a, a stabilizer a proactive stabilizer, I think, uh, uh, should further uh, be enhanced. And uh, Japan, uh, even <coughs> though uh, she cannot uh, make a rule uh, as a middle power, but I think that perhaps she can and must uh, play, uh, 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 I think, rule shaper role uh, together with like-minded countries such as Australia, <coughs> India, Canada, and Western Europe. Thank you. Awesome. So let me turn to Professor Shotang and see how that's, how do you sort of see the, the same picture from China? Well, I think uh, at this moment, <clears throat> and uh, for the uh, Chinese, they concern most is the relationship with the U.S. And it seems to me from our uh, American side, in terms of the bilateral relationship, I don't think the people give uh, attention to any other one except uh, the relationship with China because of the trade war initiated by the, uh, Trump. Well, obviously, and because the structural conflicts between China and the US, from my understanding, it's uh, very difficult to resolve, uh, to solve the, pro the trade problem between China and the US very, very easily. But uh, then, positively, and it uh, seemed to me that US and the Soviet Union, that they never carried out the trade war between them. Maybe not necessary, maybe the trade war is too, Tree few. It's uh, unimportant for the Cold War, so why they gave no, uh, they gave no attention to it? Certainly, mainly perhaps because there's no trade between them. And uh, actually, when the China and the US are heavily focused on the trade relationship between them, from my understanding, is better than they focus on the ideological conflicts between them. Uh, the ideological uh, 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 differences 
possibly will make the conflicts between China and the US even worse. So nowadays, it seems to me, on the one hand, people and the worry about the negoti trade negotiation between these two, two gens. On the other hand, people do not worry that much. And uh, I mean, they do not worry about the escalation of the trade conflicts into the military or, into the, or even the ideology conflicts. So you see even this uh, Davos organized the geopolitical uh, panel for a small room a very early morning. Seems to me, they guess no one care about this. That means no, <laughs> it's not danger, okay, it's safe. <laughs> so since China and the, U the competition between China and the US is not that dangerous, it's uh, very possibly can be constrained within the economic uh, uh, domain. So that means, and the competition between China and the US, the two, uh, two big giants, will constrain within the low politics uh, uh, area rather than high pol uh, political area. So that's a, a best part. The worst part is that uh, I don't think it's possible for China and the US to reach any agreement to fully settle down the dispute between them. This is a, com a competition. Uh, between the two countries uh, and based on the, because of uh, the uh, narrowing uh, uh, capability uh, disparity between them. So as long as the capability disparity between these two countries uh, to narrow continuously, and the conflicts and the competition between these two countries were getting worse and worse, rather than getting being improved. So I personally, I, I do not expect it, the coming uh, negotiation uh, between the two governments that can uh, uh, settle down the disputes uh, uh, permanently. The, the third point is that, and uh, why people worry about the competition between China and the US uh, that much? On the one hand, it's because of the, the trade conflicts may have an influence on everyone. If China and US reduce their import from each other and the many, many other the company in the other, other countries will suffer from the, the reduce the orders. And uh, the second thing, I think uh, even more important, is because uh, the Trump is uh, very different from the previous uh, American president. So the popular term to describe the, for him is uncertainty, because no one knows and uh, what kind of policies he will adopt it to dealing with this uh, uh, the problem. So the uncertainty make everyone a uh, uh, fear that even China and the US reach agreement, people will doubt how long that agreement can last. Two weeks, three weeks. So what's the difference? You have uh, agreements and the last for, not, uh, currently they're talking about uh, maybe they uh, try to uh, guarantee the uh, stability for three months. But uh, then what's the purpose to reach an agreement just for s three months? So now this uh, kind of uncertainty from understanding will make the whole world uh, worry about the conflicts between China and the US. And it seemed to me, and uh, as long as Trump stay in the uh, uh, office, and uh, this situation will continue. And uh, the third point is last point, how do these uh, uh, competition between China and the U US have an impact on the other countries? My understanding is very possibly, and this uh, multi, uh, uh, multilateral diplomacy being weakened, and the bilateral diplomacy and the gaining momentum. For instance, you see Trump's policy is uh, taking so-called unilateralism. He prefer to have talk bilaterally rather than participate in any multilateral dialogue because uh, any bilateral negotiation, the US has an advantage over the, uh, the other sides, but in the multilateral uh, dialogue, it's not, uh, that kind of advantage is not guaranteed. So he do not only talk with China bilaterally, with Japan, with Europe, and even with uh, Mexico and uh, Canada bilaterally, rather than the, uh, multilaterally. So what will happen? And we'll, that's my uh, observation. It seemed to me because Trump already takes this leadership of uh, bilateral diplomacy, and it becomes, already becomes a model, a sample for other countries to follow. And currently you see, and the, the Japan have reached the bilateral agreements with the EU for the free trade. And uh, uh, China and talked with Russia and uh, uh, bilaterally uh, about how to improve the economic cooperation. 
So more and more countries will prefer to do the bilateral uh, uh, discussion rather than multilateral. So in that way, the bilateral, uh, bilateral diplomacy is a, a gaining momentum. Finally, I would say, and it uh, seemed to me, and uh, as long as the uh, US is the strongest power in the world, and the US impact still the number one, and larger than anyone else. And the, the most important thing is that, no matter what the US did, it's always a sample for others to follow. It's not because it's good or bad, but people believe if the strongest guy and pre prefer to do things in that way, they think it must benefit from it. They don't think that policymakers are silly. They think they must carefully concern why they do it. So if the strongest prefer bilateral uh, a strategy, then the lesser states will ask themselves, why not us? Thank you. Thank you. So listening to the, these two views from Japan and China, it's very clear that change is real, that it actually has already uh, had a tremendous impact on, on, uh, on, the, on the order in the region, and also that there are certain clear factors that are driving it. So Kishore, tell us in reality, how much has Asia changed and in, and in what direction and how does it look from ASEAN's point of view? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very happy to provide the, I guess, the perspective of the other uh, Asian countries. And by the way, Shetong, it's a good, very good sign that the room is full at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign that they're very interested in, in this subject. And I'll make three, like, like you, I'll make three points, okay? I think the first point is that I think the region is actually quite shocked at how rapidly US-China relations have deteriorated. Uh, I would say especially in the last 12 months. You know, I'm sort of writing a book on US-China relations. I was in the US in February, March. You could see the relations drifting downhill in US-China relations. I went back in October and gosh, I thought US-China relations had fallen off a cliff. And you could see that in the speech given by Mike Pence, which was actually quite a nasty speech on China, and no one attacked him. And clearly, there is therefore a new consensus has developed in what I call the Washington DC establishment that the China threat is real. And so in response to that, I published an article in Harper saying, what China threat? <laughs> and I actually begin by saying, how is it that the top leaders have reached this absolute consensus and the one General Joseph Dunsford says, China probably poses the greatest threat to our nation by about 2025. And he's not the other, only voice, there are other voices. I mean, if you look, for example, at the fact that a group of academics have come out with a report, I think it's called Constructive Vigilance, warning about what Chinese academics, Chinese students are doing in America. Now, this is going to create a real anti-China hysteria. In fact, yesterday I was at a this small discussion, and one of the persons said, if we used to see the 336 Chinese students as opportunities for America, now we see them potentially as spies. So this, it's a very dangerous situation, and it's going to impact all of us. So the second point I'm going to make is that it's very important for both sides to do, in a sense, a strategic reboot and calculate in a very hard-headed, you know, cold, brutal, rational manner, where is the threat? What is the threat? I mean, for example, is China mounting a big armada of naval vessels about to sail to America or attack America, take over America, undermine the American economy? Is that going to happen? The answer is probably not. But it's obviously a challenge to American primacy. But American primacy was always going to erode because you've had a situation where for the last, for 1800, the last 2000 years, the two largest economies are always those of China and India. So the return of China was, India was always going to come and American primacy was going to change, erode and go away. So the question is, can we live in a world <coughs> where America is still one of the strongest powers in the world, but without the kind of primacy that it had. 
and if he can maybe shed some of his primacy and give space to others, then it's possible to have a Sino-US relationship evolving in a way that it's a win-win rather than a lose-lose situation. It can be done. And that's what the region wants to see happen. So the third and final point I'm going to make, this is in response to your point, Vali, about the global order, that if you look at it rationally in terms of the strategy that the United States should adopt to try and constrain a rising power like China, rationally what the United States should be doing should be to strengthen multilateral institutions, multilateral rules, multilateral processes that at the end of the day will constrain China inevitably. So logically, in this situation where the United States is the established power and China is the rising power, the established power should be in favor of multilateralism and the rising power should be opposed to multilateralism. But we live in a bizarre world where China is supporting multilateralism. You saw that in Xi Jinping's speech here in Davos <laughs> last year. And the United States is undermining multilateralism, which, which actually is not logical. It's not rational from American interest. And Bill Clinton, in a speech he gave in Yale in 2003, said, <coughs> if America is going to be number one forever, he said, fine. We can keep on doing what we're doing. We've got the juice. We can use it. Then he added a but. He said, but if you can imagine a world we were no longer number one. Then it's America's interest to strengthen multilateral rules, multilateral institutions, multilateral processes that will then obviously constrain the next number one, which is China. And if, you can, if America can switch from a, as you said, from a unilateral strategy to a multilateral strategy, then you'll find everybody working with America, saying, OK. For example, if China is cheating on trade, and it probably is cheating in trade in many areas. Strengthen the WTO. Don't undermine the WTO. Because the WTO, at the end of the day, is the best instrument. So if you go slice by slice, if we can work towards the world valley where we can strengthen multilateral institutions, then we can, in a sense, navigate a safe passage to what is going to be one of the biggest geopolitical contests ever between US and China. So. Um Listening to these voices from Asia, you know, one gets at least three conclusions. Uh, and one is that, as, as was also uh, a notion we heard during the Obama administration, that the uh, future global order is actually being shaped and is unfolding in Asia. And, and we, we hear that now uh, taking shape. Secondly, that, uh, uh, that the global order will be coalescing around a US-China competition, and one dare say, a US-China Cold War. And the third, as Professor Shotang said, that the, what is new this time is that it's trade that's driving this, um, as opposed to when U United States competed with the Soviet Union, which was not driven at that point by economic factors. But having said that, uh, Karen, I want to ask you, the, the security military dimension is still there. And uh, you know how, do, how does that look, let's say, from Europe and US's vantage point, and not just vis-a-vis -vis Asia, but vis-a-vis -vis also these other arenas, such as Europe or, or Middle East, where security uh, questions are still paramount? Yeah, thank you, Vali. It's a, a pleasure to be here today. And I'm trying to take up the, the Davos challenge to uh, think differently than I normally think and try to stretch. Uh, stretched myself a bit. It was really fascinating listening to this conversation because, of course, from where I sit in London, uh, yes, everyone recognizes this China challenge, uh, China-US challenge, but I think there's probably more of an obsession on Russia and the role Russia plays in Europe. I think it's a similar. Europeans worry much more about Russia, just as in Asia, there's more of a concern about China. But I think your last point you made about uncertainty, um, that's something I think we're all very worried about in, uh, I, I think, wherever we are, because uh, I think the, the challenge that Trump has posed to the global order is, uh, is that, yes, he is disruptive. And I think most of us think the system probably could need a shaking up. And we've been dealing with pretty stale uh, institutions and systems for a long time that haven't been challenged. But if you are challenging the system you need a strategic plan to implement something in its place. And I think he's been much more focused on disrupting, but I don't think he's 
has the, you know, I don't, I don't think the strategy is about what, what to put in, uh, in instead. And so I think that's where, I mean, you can go from even as, you know, a, 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 his sending 59 Tomahawk missiles into Syria in April 2017, which wasn't followed up by any meaningful diplomatic push to some of the issues you're talking about with trade, that there doesn't seem to be a plan. And that's really what, what we worry about. Now, when, when you're sitting in, in London, where I, where I am, or you know, dealing with uh, other, you know, this term like-minded countries, we're hearing a lot about that recently. And you know, that sort of who's going to be promoting these values. I won't call them Western values because I actually think they're universal values. Uh, but if America is not going to be promoting what it's been promoting since the end of the Second World War, it's becoming a bit more zero sum out there. Which countries can promote that? And there's certainly a number of countries uh, that are trying to promote some of these issues or, or values. I mean, China is even pushing on the climate change agenda. Uh, so it doesn't have to be Western countries doing this. Uh, but of course, in Europe, so many countries are distracted by their own politics. Of course, in London, everyone is completely consumed by Brexit. And many other European countries right now are fully consumed by populism. And so it's very hard for them to push out and say, you know, what should we be doing about these macro challenges? I mean, I, you know, Theresa May, uh, Prime Minister May, has been talking about global Britain for some time, but I haven't heard anyone in her government define it. And in fact, she was supposed to come here and have a speech on what global Britain means. And unfortunately, she had to cancel her trip. Uh, so I think you know that's the uncertainty challenge for me is one of the biggest problems because it's it's really it's it's a global issue and uh, anxiety doesn't help the markets. It doesn't help politics. It doesn't help. Uh, it doesn't it spills over in, in a number of ways, including in the security realm. And then I think uh, I think it's also very interesting that the three other speakers mentioned multilateralism because you, uh, absolutely you don't hear any talk about multilateralism. Uh, President Trump is not really interested in multilateral institutions. You're absolutely right, Kishore, that a multilateral approach would help to cement all of us. Uh, and it's also the case that most of our multilateral institutions are incredibly stale and need to be reformed, and it's almost impossible to reform them. Everyone keeps trying with the UN Security Council. Uh, it's just an, a, an enormous challenge to do so. It's not impossible, but it's, you know, it's been on the cards for a long time, and no one has been successful, so what's happening is they're just being bypassed right now. Uh, we don't hear enough about what the UN is doing on really any major conflict or leading on a number of these, these global challenges. Uh, and I think the, the only, my final point that I would make now is uh, that what I find interesting in Valley, you know more because you're based in the States right now, but you're hearing a lot more about multipolarity in a multipolar world pretty much everywhere. But when I'm with groups of Americans, it's not entirely clear to me that they recognize that US power may be eroding. And I certainly don't think the Trump administration recognizes that, but I think you would know more from where you're sitting. Well, at least I would say that uh, part of what has been described here uh, has to do with, 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 a, with, a, with, a, with a sort of a fear that, that China may be in some areas uh, um, uh, becoming more uh, influential, if not powerful, than the United States. And perhaps this is the this is a window, but the only window left in order to, uh, if you would, uh, cut China down to size so that they, comp they don't completely uh, uh, take over the United States in trade and other areas. But which actually brings me to a, a, an issue that often is uh, talked about in the US, that behind trade, perhaps the more important issues are issues of artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. <clears throat> and uh, which are right now outside of, let's say, all of the multilateral institutions that have regulated the other issues like trade and climate and the like. And particularly, again, you know, sitting in Europe and sitting uh, where you sit, how do you see that unfold? And perhaps Professor Xiaotong can also say something about how China sees this technological rivalry with the United States unfolding. You want to start, Karen? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, certainly uh, uh, the AI cyber challenge in China likely will be, be the leading in, in that space. Uh, I think the concerns 
in countries that, I mean, the UK is actually doing very well on AI and has a lot of, there's a lot of innovation in the UK in terms of AI. Uh, but I think, you know, I think there's still so much confusion about what it means and how to apply it and uh, how to control it. Uh, and I suppose you can add that the concerns about technology and the rapid changes in technology to this uncertainty uh, uh, feeling that, that many of us have. Um, but cyber is the other one as well. I mean, I think you can, be, you can be a small country, you can be an individual, and you can be a very powerful country uh, and play an enormous role in the cyber space. And I think that's uh, what there are certainly concerns about China and cyber, Russia and cyber, Iran and cyber, uh, and what they're doing in those spaces and how to protect everything that we do from cyber attacks. And uh, we're getting to a point really where nothing is safe right now and it's very hard to guarantee anything is secure. And I think that's, I think there has to be some sort of paradigm shift in that space going forward and I don't really know what that is. And, and you know, obviously, one of the most uh, sort of obvious recent crises around Huawei had to do uh, exactly with this this concern. So, you know, how does this look uh, from China's point of view? This competition. Well, uh, first, I think the I, I totally agree with that. The uh, technology competition uh, will be the core of the uh, uh, rivalry between China and the U.S. instead of anything else. The trade conflicts is superficial. It's not the root of the conflicts. And the world has moved into the age, so-called the information economy, the knowledge economy, I'm sorry. And in this age, and the wealth generated not from the natural resources, not from the ground, from the sea, but from the brain. So the technology and the technical invention will decide who will the, uh, the, the strongest influence in the world. So because the world has already moved into the age like what Marx never imagined it can be, and the human being can no longer consume what we produced, and every day we produce so many goods, and the human being can no longer consume all of them. So the competition for consumption market will become the, 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 the uh, focus. But how can you get that uh, 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 market? It's not because you provide goods cheap but also because you provide a cheaper but a better quality uh, the products. So that all of these, the cheaper price and the uh, higher quality based on technical invention. So that's why the competition between China and the US were rooted in a compete for adva advantage, of, advantage of technology. So this is uh, for the economy. From, from the uh, security perspective or military and uh, since the nuclear weapons can prevent the major powers of fighting into war, not only the nuclear powers dare now to go to the war against each other directly, mm -hmm. and even the non-nuclear powers, I don't think uh, uh, they have faced the danger fighting into a direct war with uh, any nuclear powers. So then what? The military means the competition between the military technology to see who has a better military equipments, more advanced technology. So the deterrence will be the main purpose of the military modernization. So in that way, both the economy and the military competition between these two countries and heavily rest on the uh, uh, technology. That's why I think this, uh, uh, this uh, technology is the uh, root of the competition. The second point is that, and uh, I agree with that, that the China's influence is increasing. Most of people attribute the China's growth of uh, in oil fields as the only factor for China's uh, increasing influence. Actually, that's not true. And the second important factor, I think as important as China's growth, is uh, um, the Trump's policy. Trump tried to quit from uh, many, many fields. And Trump even quit from the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the what, the, the, uh, the, the uh, UN, uh, not the UN uh, Education and the UNESCO. U UNESCO, from UNESCO <clears throat> and the Human Rights Committee. So you can imagine all, all of this uh, multilateral competition and uh, carried out in the international organization. When the US withdraw from that organization, well, US influence disappear. 
and certainly China, Chinese influence becomes obvious. It's not because China influence, uh, uh, increased the influence, but just because the US get away from that domain. So from understanding the current influence of uh, China's rise and uh, actually uh, 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 come from uh, two uh, factors, and China's girls and Americans uh, uh, shaping off international uh, leadership. Right. Kishore, okay, you wanted to add to that? Yes, uh, there are two points. Sure. One is, uh, you're right that the cyber dimension, technology dimension is important, but I also want to emphasize that the, the trade war is real. Mm -hmm. And if you look, for example, if you talk to policymakers in the ASEAN countries or in the East Asia and all that, we've all been affected by the trade war. Growth is slowing down, people are not quite sure yeah. how to invest, what to do. So the trade war is real, and this is where actually if there's one wish that the countries of Asia have is that please settle this as quickly as possible because the uncertainty is killing uh, all of us. And here the problem though is, what exactly is the United States strategy in this trade war? Is it trying to reduce the bilateral trade deficit? And I think if it's trying to reduce the bilateral trade deficit, it can be done. But sometimes you get the impression that what people like Navarro and Lighthizer want to do actually is to decouple the two economies and, make, and therefore in some ways slow down the China's growth. If, so if the strategy is decoupling, then it's, 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 it's going to shake the region, not just US and China. We will all suffer if there's a process of decoupling. That's why you want to know exactly what exactly is the American strategy in the trade war. But on second point on cyber, by the way, it, it's clear that, it's, and Shui Tong is right, there'll be no nuclear war because there'll be two losers. But the danger we face, of course, is that there'll be a stepping up of cyber wars. And here, this is precisely where you need multilateral rules to say, for example, if you carry out a cyber attack, don't unleash the waters of a dam that will drown hundreds or thousands of people. Don't attack hospitals and switch off the electricity and patients will die. You, you can actually create a set of rules that say, okay, you can carry out cyber warfare, but let's have clear rules on what areas you don't do. Now that's something can be done, that hasn't been done, and that should be done in the multilateral context. So before coming to you, Professor Funabashi, I wanted to sort of do a follow-up with Kishore, but I also think it, it relates to Japan. And that is that the pressure that the United States is putting on China on trade is, is forcing a lot of uh, foreign companies to move their productions outside of China. Mm. And the beneficiary of that is actually, at least in the short run, uh, are ASEAN countries. And I think that may also be the case with Japan. In other words, if, if uh, there's the, the tariffs and, uh, and other sets of things force a different kind of investment in Asia. So going forward, do you see that, that the consequence of American policy might actually be creating more uh, friction between China and ASEAN countries? Or how does this play out if, if, uh, if also the balance of production changes between, uh, where, uh, between China and ASEAN countries? And, and you say more and more factories move to Vietnam or to Philippines and the like outside of China. Actually, what's going to happen, Vali, is something that the Asian countries are not exactly enthusiastic about, which is that actually, as a result of this trade war, China will become more integrated with the rest of Asia. And actually, the United States will become det more detached from Asia as a result of this trade war. Because how the how is that? The, no, because the trade, in, in, important thing to watch, if you, I, we don't have charts here. If you had charts at the back of us to show China's trade with Asian countries, uh, including Japan uh, and Australia <coughs> and India and everyone, it's going up like this, you know. So the trade between China and Asia will continue to grow. The trade between the United States and Asia has not grown. And you can see that if they have charts behind us. And that's going to create a whole different chemistry in the past. So actually, if you're thinking strategically in the United States, United States should be pushing, pushing for greater trade engagement with Asia rather than trade detachment from Asia. Because that, at the end of the day, will determine the balance between US and China's influence in the region 10 years from now. Professor Panabashi? Yes. I think that uh, <clears throat> trade war uh, is really serious now. But, but I think that the real uh, point is uh, 
the uh, technological uh, hegemonic struggle between the U.S. and China is playing out now. And that uh, is where that real contest uh, is now, I, I think, now being waged. Uh, I think this is uh, in the area where China really is now trying to push the envelope because it's a gray zone. Uh, it's it was still lack of uh, 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 rule making and, and uh, the government is very much lack of agility uh, in harnessing that uh, some uh, uh, advanced technologies, AI and big data, facial recognition and the others. So uh, for instance, China's uh, social surveillance and political control uh, a mechanism uh, which China has been so adept uh, in uh, uh, harnessing that, those technologies, is now being exported to 14 countries according to Freedom House survey. So this is not just uh, uh, about uh, uh, you know, surplus and deficit. This is about the future of society, the future of the relationship between machine and humanity and the others. So uh, I think this is very much uh, 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 the challenge that we all are confronted. Uh, I rather doubt that uh, uh, even though with due respect to that uh, President Xi Jinping's speech two years ago at Davos and uh, China's uh, 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 deeper commitment to WTO and climate change, but nonetheless, uh, a rising power tends to be free rider uh, on the global scene, whereas that uh, being revisionist uh, on the regional setting, and China is no exception. Uh, when you look at that uh, regional setting, uh, that you, you cannot say that uh, one, road, one built one road uh, is a multilateral exercise uh, because it's lack of uh, transparency, lack of good governance, uh, and the others. And the way that China really has dealt with the South China Sea territorial issues is simply based on bilateralism, uh, uh, very much being hostile to multilateral framework. So I think that's the, how nations really behave in the region is more indicative uh, of that, uh, that thrust and the nature of the power, of the rising power. So I don't think that we really should jump to that conclusion China is a multilateral uh, uh, you know, uh, leader. I think that it's still uh, I think that China has to go some uh, length to go. So um, as this sort of new order in Asia emerges, I think a question that Karen also alluded to is, will Russia become an Asian power in a sense? Will it become a much bigger player, whether it's with North Korea or uh, in Northeast Asia and then ultimately in the region? I know. Prime Minister Abe has had engagements with, uh, with uh, Moscow. And so, so maybe we'll start with you, Professor Fanabashi, but hear from others. Uh, and, and, I, and I would say also the, the, another question, at least, which is at least from the US point of view is out there, is to what extent would this competition between China and, uh, and uh, the United States actually play out outside of Asia, in Middle East, in Africa, uh, in Europe, and so sort of bringing the rest of the world, Russia included, how, sh how should we look at this competition playing out at a bigger global stage? Well, I think it's still too early to tell how uh, Putin Abe uh, meeting will uh, play out. Uh, but I, th I don't think it, uh, that we'll see a major breakthrough. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that uh, Abe's continuous effort to uh, stabilize relationship with uh, 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 Moscow, uh, I think should be seen an attempt to uh, pursue some kind of hedging strategy against that uh, Trump administration's uh, highly opportunistic uh, uh, gambit. Uh, and this is also uh, very much uh, visible in Abe's attempt to uh, effort to uh, mend fences with uh, China. Uh, certainly, the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance uh, forms that the bedrock of uh, security and stability for Japan and the broader region 
So uh, uh, nothing can uh, replace with that. But nonetheless, I think uh, uh, there, uh, I have seen some element of hedging strategy Im involved here. I think uh, perhaps we should call it hedging light. It's not a serious hedging. It's not pivoting, not rebalancing. But nonetheless, I think there is an element of hedging. Right, and Professor Shotong, how does Russia or Europe, Middle East feature in China's play? Okay, well, uh, I think the term hedging is very popular in the media. And personally, I, uh, I'm a little bit uh, uh, thought about uh, exactly the meaning of the term hedging. I would prefer to use the term uh, uh, issue-selected alliance or issue-selected uh, 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 the balance. And uh, actually, the competition between China and US from my understanding will have the impact on, on all of the, uh, uh, the rest of the world. Every country will be influenced by that competition. So all of these other countries will take what a balancing strategy. And uh, like the ASEAN countries, once uh, especially Singapore, they do that economically, align with China, and uh, securely, uh, in terms of security, uh, will align with the US. And nowadays, uh, they adjust the policy, make it more, com uh, more delicate, and even they, in terms of the military. And uh, 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 Singapore try to maintain the equal distance between China and the uh, US. And uh, from my understanding, the uh, Abe's administration and the, uh, uh, changing his policy toward China and also follow this uh, 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 trend and uh, try to maintain a kind of a balance between China and the US. So leave more room for Japan to manipulate the situation and for Japan to uh, keep, uh, maintain his own influence for the regional uh, affairs. For the EU, for the, uh, the, 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 East, uh, the East European countries, even African countries, and more and more countries seem to me and uh, uh, follow this trend. So in the future, I, I know no country wants to be forced to say, take sides between China and the US. But then the coming bipolarization will make there's no other uh, strategy more effective than this for lesser states. That means uh, if uh, these countries find, find that, if they take the balancing strategy for them, they will make both China and the US uh, to woo them. And meanwhile, they can use this, uh, their uh, uh, neutral position to get, uh, to get a benefit from the e uh, either side. So my understanding for Abe and uh, his policy partially driven by Trump's uh, uncertainty mm -hmm. because uh, he really don't know what Trump will do ne uh, next step towards Japan. So he must uh, leave more room for him. And how can they, all of these countries uh, leave more room for them to make their own decision? And then they find that the best way is to maintain the balance between China and the US. Okay. So um, let me, well, I think it's. Can I just jump in? Sure, please. please. Just, uh, on the Russia point, I mean, I think Russia has been punching above its weight for a long time, um, all over the place. I mean, in, in, in the Balkans and the Baltics, in Western Europe with most elections in the United States. And I think in the Middle East, it's been so impressive how Russia is the one country that's maintained alliances with all sides of pretty much every dispute in that region. And I wonder, as they reach out more and more with North Korea, uh, with China and elsewhere, how much, if they'll be stretched too thin. Um, but just to quickly respond on, on a point I think that Kishore made that about, yes, this is the time when we should come up with rules for cyber and other things because it can be so disruptive. Um, but you know, the challenge has always been it's so hard to verify. And, and who's going to enforce uh, you know, the, the punishment? I mean, it's been with the Russians and what they did even in Salisbury, uh, or with hacking the U.S. elections, you see how much the, uh, the Americans and the Brits struggle to even fully pin blame on Russia. I mean, President Trump still hasn't fully acknowledged that Russia had, had done this. And so I think what we're finding is we're at a time when we need global consensus. We need multipolarity more than we've ever before, as you, as a panel has been saying. But I think it's the most challenging time to get consensus and an agreement globally because there are very few countries that are pushing that exactly because what you said earlier, we're at this zero sum, we're in the zero sum stakes right now. And so I guess I have a question for, for the panel and maybe for you too, Valley, is if Trump, Trump really does want the ultimate deal in China 
And what might he be willing to sacrifice to get that? Taiwan, US troops in South Korea. I mean, it's, it's, it can be quite frightening to think about what he might be willing to sacrifice. He may not be able to do it because it might get so much pushback from the US Congress, from, from partner countries. But I wonder about that. That's what makes me very nervous. Well, um, just in the interest of time, let, let us turn to, to the audience. Uh, there's a question right there, yes. Hi there, Ishan Daru with the Washington Post. Uh, thank you all for your remarks. Uh, just a, a quick question. Vali, in, uh, in your moderation, you, you mentioned the phrase that has become increasingly in vogue in Washington, which is the specter of a Cold War. Um, if we were to hypothetically entertain this idea, what, in our con context, would you say a US-China Cold War actually would look like? Um, and then a uh, small supplementary question. Uh, Forgive me for being naive, but I was also wondering whether as we uh, reckon with all these new revelations coming out from Xinjiang and the scale of repression that has been deployed there, does that, I mean, maybe this is a question for Kishore, does that change the ways in which certain Asian countries may interact with China, or is that a very naive assumption? So, Karen, you pointed to a Cold War. Do you want to say, like, what would a Cold War look like, say, from the traditional camp, Western camp, which engaged... Right, I mean, I would before? just say that's a great question, and uh, you do really wonderful work, so thank you for all your writing. I follow your, your blog as well. Um, I think we have to be very careful not to assume that it will be just like the Russia-US competition. I think you, you made a very good point. There will be certainly countries that try to play, play both sides, but it's going to look very different just because the world has changed and there's so much uncertainty out there. So, it, uh, you know, I, I don't have a good answer to that question, but I think it's a great question. Kishore, I, please, please, go ahead. Well, actually, I have a, a very narrow definition for Cold War. Cold War refers to the strategic competition for ideological influence and through the proxy war. And from my understanding, that won't happen between China and the U.S. Uh, uh, not talking about uh, the Chinese preference uh, uh, very, very economically oriented. And the second thing is that, look at the, the, all of the other countries. No country want to take sides. <laughs> not like the Cold War, you have two blocks and uh, the members of each block will take sides with the other side, with uh, uh, the, the, the leader and without any question. But now everyone is uh, uh, hesitant. And no matter the term hedging or anything, they say, no, I do not want to involve in your competition. I just want to take advantage of the competition. I want to take benefit from your competition. So the world has already changed. Yes, very, very quickly on the, I agree that there'll be no Cold War for, <laughs> for sure because the Soviet Union was completely cut off from the rest of the world in economic terms. China is completely integrated with the rest of the world in economic terms and you can't cut off China anymore. And, and I, whatever, my one, one quick message is don't underestimate the effects of the Belt and Road Initiative. 10 to 15 years from now when you meet here, you'll be talking about the BRI big time, watch out. And then on the point about Xinjiang, you know, the, as you know very well, the Asian countries, would, if, if they want to raise a human rights issue, they would never raise it publicly. It's not, it's not the Asian style. They will do it privately, go and talk to the governments and do so. But what's interesting about the Xinjiang case is that China is supposed to be oppressing Muslims in this country. I cannot think of a single Muslim country that has actually raised this publicly. I know of many Western countries who have done so. <laughs> so the, the question therefore is, why are the Muslim countries being so silent on this? What's the story behind that? Right. I would just say that to all of this that the last time the Cold War happened, there was clearly a sense in the West of an existential threat, mm. which I don't think is quite there yet uh, uh, with China. So, Mr. Janahi, here. Uh, here. Sorry, I have a, um, a statement and a question. My name is Jean Pascal Divus. I'm a European. We're investing at scale in CIS in Asia, in Europe, and in the US. And my first statement is you said that you wish you could call Western values universal values because they are not Western. I wish you were right, I think you're wrong. And I think it would not resist any analysis and it's probably a big mistake in an international relationship to make that assumption, yeah. whatever my beliefs are. The, the other point is we, we talked about geopolitics and Trumps and Abe and um, Xi Jinping. Nobody spoke about the underlying 
what I call the unhappy 25% in the Western world, maybe in the US and Europe, which is driving uh, Brexit, Trump election, the Italian government, the fact that in France the biggest party is the uh, extreme right. And I think these people are, have been perception of reality, I don't know, left aside by the globalization, by AI, by uh, greater urbanization. And that, I think, is a big, big power that is going to shape geopolitics because it's going to shape politics in the Western world because it's a democratic world and they're taking over um, a bit. Um, next is here, Mr. Janahan. Thank you very much. Khaled Janahi. Actually, um, Kishore's point about no Muslim country raising any point, I mean, as a layman Muslim, I would say basically because majority of these Muslim countries are autocratic countries. And they don't give a damn about individuals, as we see and we've seen. I want to raise a point actually about Iran. I mean, the changes which is happening today with all the relationships across the world and the way we look into the future, where is going to be the position, say, by 2020, with what's going on between China and the United States, with other countries in the United States, what will be the position of the nuclear Iran, where we are today and where we're going to be in 2020? I think Vali can answer that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. What I would say, to, in the context of what we, we've been speaking, uh, there's, a, there's a good possibility that this competition will get out of Asia, and then wherever there is, there is possibility of, of, uh, of taking sides or, 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 or amassing power, whether it's in Europe, in Iran, uh, in Africa, I think we'll see this competition. Uh, unfold there. And, and alternately, countries like Iran would see advantages in this competition. Because if you don't have a multilateral world that is likely to enforce the same uh, set of rules uh, uh, on a country like Iran or North, North Korea, then uh, the sort of selective ad hoc uh, issue alliances or, or, or leverage, whatever we call it, becomes much more attractive to, to varieties of countries. We actually see that already <coughs> Uh, uh, playing out uh, uh, because there is no clear consensus, let's say, on sanctions on Iran between Russia, Europe, China, and on the other hand, U.S. has secondary sanctions are potentially also threat to countries like China down the road that you see sort of issue alliances beginning to emerge. Then we had a question on this side. This gentleman. Um, I'd like to drag an elephant into... Uh the conversation uh, by the name of India. Mm. It seems to me India is the only country in the world with the demographic heft to balance China. And so I'd like to ask anyone who cares to take it up, what is the geopolitical role of India in an emerging multipolar world? Well, as, as the only, I think, as the only ethnic <laughs> Indian in this panel. <laughs> Uh, I was actually going to mention in response to your question about Please Russia go. that the Russia's influence certainly in East Asia and ASEAN is very minimal because it doesn't trade with the region. And the name of the game is trade. And this is also unfortunately India's weakness. India is not as open in trade as it should be and as it could be. But nonetheless, there's absolutely no question. I mean, you look at the Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, prediction that by 2050, the number one economy in the world will be China, number two will be India, number three will be United States of America. Now, that's going to create a whole different geopolitical game. Right now, India is internally preoccupied. Certainly in 2019, Modi is only going to worry about the elections and nothing else. But you can see the muscles of India developing. And gradually, and if you watch, for example, India's interaction uh, in Asia, they're getting thicker and thicker. So India's influence is growing in the region. Ali, can I just jump in Please. really quickly? I think it, it's a really good question because a third of the world's population right now live in two countries, right? And it's just impossible to imagine that India won't emerge more. And I don't think any of us are thinking about it or, or governments are thinking about it as strategically as they should. And just briefly on your point, um, my point about values, uh, you have to distinguish between what governments think. Certainly governments don't support any Western value or universal values, but uh, what people in those countries do support. And I think you'll find from polls amongst people in many, many countries throughout the world that they do still subscribe to, uh, to these values. Thanks. Um, yeah, this lady here.
just a quick question. Um, my name is Yuki Hasaga from uh, Japanese newspaper Yomiuri Shimbun. I'd like to ask Ms. Professor Mahbu Mani about, uh, you mentioned about cyber war. Uh, you suggested there is a need for a kind of rule of en engagement on how to use cyber warfare. But it seems, do you think it's realistic? It seems that we're not even at a point where we can discuss what to do with the space, how we engage in space. So I was kind of wondering if it's ever possible to come up with any rules on that kind of sphere. Well, I mean, I, I, I happen to meet one of the world's leading cybersecurity experts uh, over lunch. He's from Israel, actually. And it, what's interesting is his ranking of countries that are number one, number two, number three, number four in cyber warfare. Of course, number one is United States. Number two is uh, Russia. I think number three, number four, UK and Israel. And number five, I think, is China uh, in his ranking of how. So the, the people who play the game know the game. The people who play the game know actually what they're doing to each other. And you're asking about who's, somebody asked who's going to police it. They know among themselves what's really going on. So it, it is, of course, a very complex game. But the professionals exactly know who's carrying out what attacks where and so on and so forth. And by the way, there are no saints in this exercise. Huh? Everybody's playing that game. So the question is whether they, all these people agree, OK, let's keep this out of bounds. This is within bounds. And I think if you, if you get the professionals to talk to each other, I think they can work something out. So unfortunately, we're at the end of our time. So please join me in uh, thanking our panel for an excellent talk.